So, uh, Professor, nice to meet you. And finally, nice we connect and you. give us some hiccups. Gaudi waiting for, uh, to listen to you. I have kept your uh, book in my hand. <laughs> nice. And, uh, what you have, you have written, it has be picturely, picturely portrayed everything that happens in Lucknow. <laughs> so I remembered everything, including your. Wonderful. No, I, I'm so glad you like the book and uh, hopefully. No, Some of the no, youngsters no, will also no, get to I read it. Come yes, and uh, I have already prescribed it as a non-academic reading in management school. And Wonderful. I have already procured it. Your small Wonderful. management sutras are very apt. <laughs> Thank you. No, I'm very glad to be connected. Thank you so much. So, uh, Aditya ji, now we can start. Yeah, sure. Should we, uh, sure. let me just uh, put up my uh, screen. I, 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 if it's okay, I'll, you know, I can put it, uh, talk for about 20 minutes and then maybe we can, 20, 25 minutes, we can open it up. I'm just trying to see, share screen. Yes, sir. Uh, presenter rights have been given, sir, to you. Okay, got it. So, let me just... Can you see the screen? Yes, sir. I'm able to see, but it's not uh, presentation mode, sir. Please. Okay, I'll just put it. Great. Great, sir. Can you see it? Perfect. Right. So, uh, good evening, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls. I, Professor Aditya Sankar Misra, welcome you to the second webinar under the leadership series being conducted by Atal Bihari Vajpayee Center for Leadership, Policy and Governance, a center of excellence under IIM Ranchi. For your information, the first webinar in the leadership series was with Mr. Vijit Banerjee and Mr. Arun Balakrishnan of Linde India. Our center is trying to disseminate the knowledge which is based on the experience gained by the great administrators and innovators, especially when the timelines now have been rechristened from the before Christ and after Christ to pre-COVID and post-COVID era. These experiences have become more relevant and handy to tackle the black swan events like the present one. Today's topic is implementing large-scale transformative projects in India, lessons for young professionals. As a speaker for today's lecture, we have Mr. Parmeswaran Ayer among us. Mr. Ayer is currently the global lead for strategic initiatives in the World Bank's water global practice. Prior to this, he served as secretary uh, to the government of India at the Ministry of at the Ministry of Water Resources, at the Ministry of Drinking Water and Sanitation, which is now under Ministry of Jal Sakti as department, uh, from March 2016 until August 2020 and led the implementation of the flagship Swachh Bharat mission. A former IAS officer, Ayer headed the innovative community-led Swajal project in Uttar Pradesh and Uttarakhand in 90s, has over 25 years of global experience in the water and sanitation sector, and has worked in many countries, including Vietnam, China, Egypt, and Lebanon. His profile speaks volume about his works in water conservation and sanitation. A quote comes to my mind, highlighting the importance of water conservation. Once ex-president of United States, Mr. Kennedy said, anyone who can solve the problems of water will be worthy of two Nobel Prizes, one for peace and one for science. Mr. Ayer has recently authored a book titled as Method in the Madness, in this book, he reflects on the unique path he chose from cracking the IAS to becoming a global trotting World Bank technocrat, to playing the role of a coach to his professional tennis playing daughter, to finally returning to India and implementing the Swachh Bharat mission. We welcome you, sir, to the webinar. Next, I would like to introduce 
the honorable director in uh, of im ranchi professor salinder singh ji prior to this present assignment professor singh was the dean research and a senior professor in the area of human resource management at indian institute of management lucknow he had also served as the president and has been elected as a fellow of national academy of psychology india he has more than 34 years of post phd research and teaching experience he also has a vast and varied experience in training administration administration and consultancy we welcome you sir further i welcome, welcome colleagues from the center professor ansuman hazarika and professor gaurav marathe to the webinar and would request them to take care of the question answer question and answer session and validity sections last but not the least i would like to welcome the audience and would request them to listen to the distinguished speaker and enhance their information to maintain the decorum of the session i would like to lay some ground rules first other than a speaker i would request everybody to keep your mic off please you can write your questions if you have any in the comment box which will be dealt after the speaker finishes his speech now i request honorable director sir to please take over and say few words about the atal bihari vajpayee center over to you sir thank you thank you aditya ji about the center atal bihari vajpayee center for leadership policy and governance has been established in 2018 uh, in the name of uh, real statesman let sri atal bihari vajpayee ji the state of jharkhand has a uh, start its existence during his stewardship um, as a prime minister and we are trying to give real tribute by practicing and teaching the principle of leadership policy and governance at im ranchi we have started many initiatives uh, in the center including many symposia seminars research studies we have also undertaken uh, summer schools winter school uh, very recently we completed one uh, research uh, and case study uh, series of seminars in the month of june and this uh, program the talk by sri iid is a uh, again a step forward in the same direction i welcome sri parmeshwaran iir ji to from the bottom of my heart and request all the participant uh, to listen carefully uh, the, the transformative experience that he has uh, experimented with and going to share uh, his experience and if you have any question that touches your heart and mind please ask your question at the end of his presentation i um, hand over uh, the space and stage to sri parmeshwaran iirg thank you thank you very much uh, good afternoon to all of you in ranchi uh, first of all i would like to express my gratitude to the director professor shailendra singh for for being kind enough to invite me uh, to make uh, a short presentation and to talk about the swachh bharat mission as well as my book which describes it thank you also uh, aditya singh ji for the kind introduction and good afternoon to all the faculty and and students and young colleagues from iim ranchi let me say at the outset that uh, it's a pleasure again to connect with ranchi I've been there many times when I was uh, in my previous job as secretary in the government of India, and uh, it's a lovely place to visit. Uh, some good friends in Ranchi as well, and uh, Jharkhand, uh, you know, really picked up the pace in the Swachh Bharat Mission, and uh, has brought about one or two iconic symbols into the program, such as the Rani Mysteries, which were pioneered in Jharkhand. So what I'm going to do is. i'm going to first of all tell you a little bit about this uh, this mission this transformative program uh, which you know was led and and pioneered by the honorable prime minister 
And of course, I should also mention it's a privilege to be uh, giving this lecture at the Atal Bihari Vajpayee Leadership Center. Uh, I'm sure this, this series will continue and thrive. So let me uh, say a little bit. So I, I finished my four and a half year stint in the government of India end of August last year, 2020, and I returned to the World Bank. And as you will see from uh, the title of the book, it's insights from my career as an insider in government, an outsider in the World Bank, and also as a coach and manager for my tennis playing uh, children, my daughter and my son. And then I returned to the government of India as an insider. And in fact, the idea of writing this book came from my wife during the lockdown, uh, the first lockdown in, in March 2020. When my travel to the States, you know, I used to uh, travel at least once a week, maybe twice a week. And I've, you know, traveled more than 250 times all over the country. As you all appreciate in a federal system, it's important for the government of India to be reaching out to state governments, which are implementing programs. But when the travel was stopped, I saved a bit of time. And so my early morning stint from about 4.30 to 7.30, I started writing this book and managed to get a first draft out in about six months. And then it took some time to finish it. So that's how this uh, book was written. And you'll also be happy to know that all the author's proceeds uh, go to the Swaj Bharat Kosh, which is uh, uh, a unit in the Government of India and the Ministry of Finance, which receives donations from public and private, which goes towards making uh, progress on sanitation across India, rural and urban. So I thought I'll give you a little bit of background. I'm very glad to know that the Director has also prescribed this as non academic reading. Hopefully, you enjoy the book as well. So, let me start out straight away with uh, what was the, the problem being faced in India in 2014, the big problem, right? And you can see from this slide, the scale was very big, right? I mean, for all of us who have lived in India, and who have worked there, we understand the, the magnitude of, this, of the issues in India. But for an international audience, just the size, 1.3, 1.4 billion people, of which uh, you know, more than almost 600, 600 million people, 550 million in rural India, were practicing open defecation in 2014, which was about 60% of the world's open defecation practitioners. So it was a, not only a challenge in India, it was a global challenge. And a Sustainable Development Goal 6.2 would not have been achieved if India had not made progress towards this goal. And of course, we know we have got more than 6 lakh villages, more than 700 districts, 36 states. But where was the progress on sanitation? And you can see from that graph that from independence till about 1980, it was practically zero, right? And when we talk of rural sanitation coverage, basically in India, we're talking about having individual household latrines. Now, these are individual units typically in households. You can also have community toilets, but network sanitation or sanitation with sewer lines and with wastewater treatment plants are very rare in India. So only 25% of urban India I'm not talking of rural, of the 4,000 odd urban, urban local bodies, only 25% have network sanitation. Uh, the remaining 75% of urban India, and of course, entirely rural India, in urban India, you've got septic tanks, which have to be emptied, as all of you know, and which have to be emptied and typically dumped. In rural India, a different model was followed of the twin pit port flush latrine, which is an excellent technology, environmentally friendly. I'll come to that a little later. So we're talking of that technology, which was only about 39% in 2014. So some progress had been made incrementally in the 80s, 90s, but it was still very low. And even then there were about 550 million people practicing open defecation in rural India. So that was the challenge. And we tried to frame the challenges with the 4S framework. These were the four major challenges we faced. The first was scale, which we just referred to. How do you really change the behavior of these people? Because it's one thing to build infrastructure. 
it's another thing to change behavior, which is much more difficult. And uh, Professor Shalen Singh, with all his experience in organizational behavior, et cetera, you know, he will know better than anyone else the challenge of changing behavior in organizations, but at this scale, very, very difficult. And how do you do it? The second S is speed. Now, not, not much had happened over the 75 odd years, 70 years since independence. And now the Honorable Prime Minister had given us a five year window. And when he announced this program from the ramparts of the Red Fort, 15th August 2014, my wife and I were in Vietnam and in the World Bank. And we were amazed to hear the Prime Minister talking about toilets, uh, defecation, the indignity for women and girls in particular who have to go out either in the dark in the evening or early morning. So he gave a window of five years and he said, by the 150th birth anniversary of Mahatma Gandhi, the country will become open defecation free. So we have to create a sense of urgency and avoiding that drip drip incremental approach, which had been hitherto practice. And then we came to the issue of stigmas. So all kinds of stigmas and myths about sanitation in India, right? And many of you would have seen this in that very good Bollywood movie called Toilet Ek Prem Katha where having a toilet inside the house is considered impure. So different kinds of beliefs, it's better to go, is considered better than to have a toilet inside your house. So many of these stigmas had to be changed and behavior change, changing habits and beliefs, which were held for generations, are what is known as a wicked problem, very difficult to solve. And behavior change was at the heart of this program. So that was the third problem. And then, of course, the fourth challenge was sustainability. Even if you achieve behavior change, even if you construct the toilets, how do you make sure people don't slip back into old habits? And uh, as, as some of you would have, or many of you would have read that book called Nudge, which was co-authored by Taylor and Sunstein. Taylor won the Nobel Prize for Economics. Sunstein, the co-author, is a lawyer. Uh, he came to India and he, and he studied this program. And he was amazed to find nudge being practiced at scale. And he told us that, listen, it's a great progress you're making, but make sure that you sustain the outcomes of open defecation free, because typically people slip back into old habits and it takes three to five years to make sure that behavior is sustained. So that was the fourth challenge we faced. Now, how do you deal with these challenges? And we realized that the the way we could deal with scale was with scale. So Team Swaj Bharat, it became a Jan Andolan, was practically the whole country. And you can see we had 120 million school students. The best ambassadors for Swaj Bharat. Youngsters learned very quickly the importance of using toilets and they can influence their teachers, their parents, their communities. And then of course, we had to have masons because we built more than 10 crore toilets. So at any point, there were even more than a million, but importantly, many of them were women. And women actually went from being beneficiaries of the program to leaders. Here in Jharkhand in particular, this will be uh, interesting news for all of you at IIM Ranchi. You will see they created Rani Mistri. So women started becoming masons. That spread across the country. It sent the message of women leadership, female leadership, but also of economic empowerment. And then we had Swacha Grahis, the name given by the Honorable Prime Minister. These were village level motivators, about one on average per village, who were trained in behavior change. How do you trigger a community into understanding the importance of the entire village becoming open defecation free? And you can see we had a whole army of Swacha Grahis. Then, of course, Sarpanches or Mukhiyas, as they're known in Bihar and Jharkhand, where we had, the country had about two and a half lakh Sarpanches or Mukhiyas. District collectors who were leading the program on the ground and integrating all the government programs. And then we had young professionals uh, called Zilla Swaj Bharat Preraks. These were given to us by the Tata Trust. They were young professionals. In fact, quite a few, I think, came from IIMs, the newer IIMs. I don't know if any came from Ranchi, but we had people from Indore and other IIMs who were spent about a year and a half to two years in the field attached to the collector. They were the eyes and ears of the district magistrate or of the deputy commissioner, I think, as they're known in, uh, 
in Chankan. And then there were also our eyes and ears in the government of India for monitoring purposes. So they made a very big difference in pushing the momentum of the program. And you will read a little bit about that in the book. And then we had brand ambassadors, you know, all the way from Amitabh Bachchan, other Bollywood superstars, Nasaratan Tata, sports icons, and all of them helped to create the buzz at the national level. And of course, we were very fortunate to have the Prime Minister of India as our communicator in chief. And you know, that charisma of the Prime Minister, the political leadership, everything made a very big difference. And how did we deal with speed, that five-year window? The PM's vision had to become a mission. And I think this is really important to understand in large-scale programs. You have to you have to roadmap it, right? And uh, it's one thing to throw out a, a very big vision, and then the implementation team needs to convert that into reality on the ground. So these were some of the steps we took. We set some milestones, we had some quick wins. And if you can see the map of India on the right, that was there about two, three months after I joined. We had only 16 open defecation free ODF districts in India. And these were typically the states and districts which traditionally had done well on human capital indicators. So Sikkim in the Northeast, then we had uh, a couple in Kerala and Himachal Pradesh, some in Bengal. So the idea was how do we build on these and then how do we focus on the low hanging fruits so that we can get some quick results, which will have a demonstration effect and inspire the rest of the districts and states in India. And then we had champion collectors. We had the district magistrate of Bikaner, Arti Dogra. We had Salim, who was the collector in, in, uh, in Bengal, in Nadia. So we took the young collectors who are doing well, we influenced others, we created champions, collectors, sarpanches, swachagris, and so the momentum grew, and that became really important, of taking that vision to a mission. It had speed. We now come to stigmas, right? And again, you'll find this quite interesting uh, in a management school. There were some assumptions which uh, were made traditionally by the government across the board. Then if you give a free toilet, everyone would use it, right? And this was the assumption which had been going on for 30, 40 years. But what was the reality which we found both from experience in India, but also globally, whether it was Vietnam or Ethiopia or Indonesia, typically, in, in the Indian rural context, toilet was a product. There was no in, intrinsic demand for it. It had to be stimulated, even though it was free. So the assumption was of rationality, right? And the messaging earlier spoke about health and economic benefits of toilets, but mainly health. You, you know, you must have a toilet. Otherwise, you know, everyone will fall sick. But the reality was the non-rational motive whether it was love or dignity or disgust, were actually far more powerful. I'm going to give you some examples of this, and you will read about it in the book as well. So for here, for example, and that could even be, uh, you know, a tribal art. It's either from Jharkhand or from somewhere in Orissa, and you can see how pride became a very important driving factor. The picture is there of the prime minister who is completing the construction of a twin pit toilet in Varanasi. And you'll see Izzat Ghar written on the top of that pink toilet. And in UP, they started using the term Izzat Ghar. So particularly for women and girls who did not have to go out in the open, it became a symbol of pride, of dignity. And that was used extensively in campaigning. And you can see toilets were painted beautifully. They were made attractive. And we started a campaign called uh, Mera Sundar Shaochalai. And so pride became a big trigger of changing behavior and of getting village communities as a whole to start accepting the importance of toilets from a health point of view. But the trigger was sometimes it was pride and dignity. Now, another important uh, lever was disgust, the kind of opposite. And here you're seeing a scene where a swachagrahi somewhere in North India is actually triggering the village community using disgust as an entry point. How? So what she does is, this was a technique which was taught, she would get hold of a human hair, she would dip it in human excreta somewhere lying around in the village, and then she would put that hair dipped in excreta into a glass. You can see it on the left. 
of water. And then she would hand that glass of water around. And everyone would immediately recoil in disgust. She would say, Apani Piji. And everyone would refuse because it was disgusting to think of drinking water where there was a hair dipped in human excreta. And then she would explain how in the village, even if some households had toilets, but others did not, the excreta lying around in public places, flies would sit on them and use all their six legs to come back and fly and sit on your chapati at home. If you're sitting outside, flies will come and sit on your food. So that was disgusting. And so people started understanding the importance of having toilets, of containing the excreta and not going outside, also improving health. But disgust became a very important tool in triggering behavior change. And of course, other levers, emotional ones like love. And this is a cartoon done by the late Sudhir Dhar. And you can see from here how the gentleman has got everything. And he's you know, proposing marriage to the lady who has just come back from defecating in the open in unfriendly, rainy conditions. And she's saying, listen, I don't care about all that. You have a toilet at home. And so Toilet Ek Prem Katha, which is exactly about this story. Many of you would have seen that movie. Akshay Kumar became a good friend. Uh, he made the movie, he consulted us, and it was a very powerful story and message about female empowerment and how they can take a leadership role through the issue of toilets. I'm going to play a little clip from Toilet Ek Prem Katha. It's a very powerful scene. Uh, it's a series of clips, so let me see if I can play this. Sir, I'm going to share that now. Sir, no sound. No sound? Yes, sir. Yes. Uh, unfortunately, sir, uh, the sound is not working. Oh, sorry. One minute. Sorry about that. Uh, and so the sound didn't work, uh, but I'll, I'll send this presentation to you and you know, you can play it later. It's a very powerful scene from the movie of how uh, Bhumi Pednekar who's playing the, you know, the heroine in the movie, how she mobilizes the community and all the women in fact stopped going out in the open because of her leadership. So uh, a, a very, very powerful movie. Uh, I'm sorry, the audio didn't work. Uh, I probably didn't press the right thing, but coming, continuing with this, and we can come back to that if you like. Addressing stigmas, again, leading by example. So, you know, what we did was to destigmatize the emptying of toilet pits. So I entered a toilet pit in Barangal in February 17. Just to show that the twin pit model, which I spoke about, is totally safe, right? It's environmentally friendly, and you don't have to worry about emptying and disposing of the contents, because actually they become organic manure. Uh, it's, there are two pits, leach pits. When one of them is filled up, you stop the flow there, you divert to the second pit, and then you wait for about a year and a half, and then the solid settles down, the liquid oozes out, and actually the solid then becomes harmless compost. So we remove the contents, we fill it in our hands, and therefore, you know, this was important. And then we had Akshay Kumar doing it. We had the CEO of Niti Aayog, the Comptroller and Auditor General of India. Lots of collectors did this to promote the use of the twin pit. And then, of course, we use other means like radio. And radio, as you know, has a penetration of over 95%, uh, not as much, much more than television. And then we had someone called Salesman Shwacha Singh, who was debunking all kinds of myths and stigmas around the usage of toilets. Social media, which all of us are very used to, but not so much in rural India, although it's increasing. And so it was important also to target the urban audience to tell them what's happening in rural India. Our followership went up to more than half a million. Of course, much more needs to be done, but it was not bad for a kind of Sarkari social media platform. And then, of course, using uh, you know mainstream media and mass media, Toilet Ek Prem Katha uh, became a very, very powerful 
symbol. Incidentally, it was also a big commercial success. Now, coming to the fourth S, how do you sustain all these gains? And, you know, this is really important. Uh, it's one thing to campaign in, uh, you know, somebody said you in a political, you campaign in poetry, but you have to govern in prose. And so sustaining in steady state is very difficult. Uh, you can continue the excitement for five years. So we had to move, we started planning this to move from ODF to ODF plus, by which we meant the first was to sustain ODFness, to make sure people continue to use toilets. So the communication, the capacity building, the incentives had to continue. And these are, were embedded in Swaj Bharat phase two, which is going on now from 2019 to 2024. We also broadened the definition of sanitation. So we went from ODF to ODF plus, and now the, the work is going on on solid and liquid waste management. On organic waste management, how do you gather gober and agricultural waste and convert it into energy? There's a program called Gober Dhan. Plastic waste management, minimizing the use of single use plastic, recycling, grey water management. There's a big program which we started called the Janjeevan Mission where pipe water supply has to be provided to 150 million, 15 crore rural households, but the water coming out of a tap and out of bathing can be recycled uh, with minimal treatment used for recharging the groundwater, but also for agriculture. And fecal sludge management, which is basically emptying of septic tanks wherever they exist, but making sure that the contents are properly disposed of. We also created a 10-year strategy for rural sanitation. Because the work on sanitation never ends. You know, that's one question many people ask me. If, you know, the states declared themselves ODF, but I still see people defecating. And that will continue because it's at a point of time. The work to make sure no one is left behind, to deal with migrant population, with households which might have been left out. So that work needs to continue. It will never stop. And so here are the outcomes of uh, the Swaj Bharat mission. Can uh, see the sir, two maps. Uh, no. Mr. Ayer, sorry to interrupt you for a minute. So suddenly, sir, your voice has reduced a little bit. Uh, so okay, let me uh, check. Uh, can you hear me now? Yes, Is it better now. Better, better now. Okay. So better now. Sorry. Okay, sorry. Yeah. So uh, again, you can see from these two maps of India. These are two powerful symbols. Symbols are important of progress made. And we realized that these were far more powerful than putting out statistics. On the left, that was the map when the program started. It was all brown and red. And uh, then it moved to green. And you can see on the left, so many people changed their behavior. So many toilets were constructed. And those were the results which were achieved. Uh, and Honorable Prime Minister was present when we had a big event at the Sabarmati Ashram along the banks of the river Sabarmati in Ahmedabad on 2nd October 2019. Now, the broader impact of the program is equally important. And because there are many externalities which this program led to. For example, and it was also important to get external agencies to validate instead of Sarkari propaganda you know, external evaluations became quite important. Whether it was the World Bank doing an annual sanitation survey and finding that usage of toilets was about 90%, or study by the WHO, which found that more than 3 lakh lives were saved every year and would continue to be saved because of having toilets and using them. Typically, children below the age of five, as you know, they can die of diarrheal diseases, which are prevented when you have used toilets. Then you have economic benefits. Every household in an ODF village was saving up to 50,000 rupees a year on account of avoided medical fees. You don't have to go to a doctor or time savings. So many jobs were created in the ancillary industry. It also saves the environment because groundwater gets less polluted when excreta doesn't go into it. Now, uh, I've got another video, but I don't know whether the, the sound is going to work. Probably not. I don't know how to make the sound work. But this was what Amita uh, Bachanji did for us. A campaign called Darwaza Bang, shut the door on open defecation. 
this is the, the second part of the campaign where he they're celebrating the village which has become ODF and the Asli champions are the community because they continue to use toilets. So the tagline was Har Koi, Har Rose, Amesha to sustain the toilet. I'll show you the clip. I'm sorry if the sound is not. I don't think the sound will work. Yeah, sorry about that. You had Har Koi, Har Rose, Amisha. Okay, now I'm coming to the end of the first part of the presentation. And, you know, this was very important to be talking about the lessons we have learned from such a large program, probably the biggest behavior change program ever globally. And internationally, there was huge interest. And, you know, now that I'm working, I'm, I've come back to the World Bank, I'm talking to you from Washington, D.C. Globally, there's huge interest and a lot of lessons to be learned. And many countries have started their own programs based on this. So the Clean Nigeria campaign started from Swadbar. China, Indonesia, Ethiopia, they're all learning from this. What were the four major lessons we have learned? We call them the four Ps. And the first is something which we might be taking for granted in India, but never before as a very mundane and lowly subject like sanitation. Being received attention at the highest level in any country. So this was critical. The Prime Minister of India, who spoke about sanitation and toilets on the Red Fort, that level of leadership became critical. But the second equally important was public financing. Because remember that sanitation is a public good, by which I mean that it affects everyone. So half the villages may have toilets, other half don't, it affects everybody. So it's important to address a public good with public financing. The government of India and the state governments together invested more than $20 billion, which is about 1.3 lakh crores over five years. So they believed in it, the finance minister of India, with scarce resources invested in sanitation, which has a very high return. But that became the second P. For many countries, even if there's political leadership, the, their finance minister who has to allocate scarce resources, does not necessarily prioritize sanitation. This was the second lesson. It's important to do that. And the third was partnerships. And that's a picture of the Honorable Prime Minister and the Secretary General of the United Nations. On his first visit to India, he came for Swaj Bharat, along with some a few central ministers, but 55 ministers of sanitation and health from other countries who came to participate in the Mahatma Gandhi International Convention on Sanitation on Swal Bharat. And so partnerships with, with development organizations, with NGOs, with media, with private sector, with sarpanchas, with school children, again critical. But this program cannot be run in a sarkari. And then finally, we have people's participation. Very, very critical. Where you have it's critical to make it a Jan Andolan, right? Without that, this program would not have succeeded. And so I'm now coming to uh, my book, uh, which about half of which is, tells you the kind of more inside story of the Swat Bharat mission. Again, uh, you know, my wife's idea to call it a method in the madness, and it's insights from my career, uh, as, as I mentioned. Um, also focusing a lot, a lot of pro tips in the book, which the director was kindly referring to. And if you read the book, you'll see it's in three parts. The first part is how I tried for many jobs and failed, how I tried to become a tennis professional and did not succeed. And then I was very lucky, I got into the civil service. So the first part of the book is 
telling you the first 17, 18 years of my career. I was in Government of India, I was a district magistrate in Bijnor, and then I stumbled into a specialization into water and sanitation. And then that starts the second part of the book, which is the outsider part, uh, between 1998 and 2016, where it's about how I worked in the World Bank, I worked in different parts of the world, in Afghanistan, in, in Lebanon, in Egypt, in Vietnam, and interestingly, how a different perspective then in the government, it's mainly about hierarchy, right? Which batch are you? How senior are you? In the World Bank, it's more about knowledge. It's quite flat, and respect is actually commanded by your knowledge, not your hierarchy. And so how I went from a bureaucrat to a technocrat. Then I took a break. I resigned from the World Bank. My daughter was playing professional tennis. She was, you know, number two to Sanya Mirza, her name is Tara. And so I was a road manager and coach and we traveled around the world for two years. Uh, here are some pictures, illustration when I was SDM subdivision magistrate in Dehradun in undivided UP, and I made a big mistake. I'd gone and arrested the, the wrong truck driver. So that story was carried in the headlines. I'm looking a little worried there. Here's my stint as a road manager, and Wimbledon is going on now for those who watch tennis, but similarly at a lower level, I'm taking statistics, right? Percentage of first serves, unforced errors, the number of times uh, you come to the net, and that helps to improve the game in the, in the subsequent tournaments. So uh, it's a little illustration of that. And this is, uh, you know, emptying that toilet pit in Barangal. So uh, you'll find the you know, book is written with a light sort of humorous style. So it's, it's relatively easy reading. It's not some very heavy autobiography of an IAS officer. And these are some excerpts on, you know, what I did before I joined, and you can see how I failed miserably in an interview when Dr. Bharatram, the founder of the DCM Empire, I went for an interview, and he asked me what is deflation, and it sounds pretty foolish, but I had no clue what was deflation, so I did not know, and he laughed and said, "Well, it's the opposite of inflation," so uh, I did, of course I did not get the job. But it exposed my total lack of, you know, general knowledge, let alone economics. And this is a stint, uh, a little excerpt from my first day on the job when I was district magistrate of Bijnor, which is somewhere in Western UP, about three hours from Delhi. And how, you know, the district magistrate or the deputy commissioner has got many gadis, and I returned with one car. Uh, so it's a little humorous episode. And then, of course. This is an important uh, message which you know which I've been talking. I talk a little bit also to the Masuri IAS Academy. And one I think I strongly believe in, it's become a topic of interest generally today. I think that IAS officers need to start specializing after about 10 to 15 years of field experience. Otherwise, we'll end up being jack of all trades. And I stumbled into a water and sanitation specialization, but I think it needs to be better planned for future generations. So I think this is an important topic and uh, something which I've been discussing with, with colleagues in the Niti Aayog and the government of India as well. And finally, some pro tips from the book. Uh, there are about 30 odd of them, about two per chapter. They're all coming out of my experience. And let me just share uh, these four with you. And the top left, you will see about transferring your worry to somebody else, particularly in India, which has a federal system and where sanitation and water are state subjects. Now, the federal government has to incentivize state governments to deliver, right? And therefore, you have to transfer your worry. Now, you may, it, it applies everywhere. In all organizations as leaders, many of the tasks have to be achieved by other people, not by you. You can do it, but you need to get others to do it. So how do you get, you may be a Radhani Express, but if somebody else is a passenger, train, how do you get the passenger train to become a Rajdhani? So you need to transfer your worry, your concern, your motivation to others. And that was our job in the government of India. We had to get the state governments to be interested in the problem. The other one is, on the top right is, look, leaders, managers, uh, bosses are always looking out for new ideas. So don't be worried about proposing some ideas. It may sound a bit crazy. Uh, it may get accepted, it may not, but everyone is looking out for initiatives. So don't worry about it. Don't be shy, propose your ideas. Bottom left, very practical. 
from my own experience. Take notes in a meeting. Uh, when I joined as private secretary to the Ministry of Defense, the first day I walked into his office without a notebook, without a pen, he started rattling out instructions. And I just kept nodding. And then he told me, he said, Mr. Arya, you might have a photographic memory, although I didn't. He was just being polite and sarcastic. But please carry a notebook and a pencil next time you enter my room. So I remember that and I've always carried a pencil or notebook or a no or you know an iPad. Take notes because you you might be confident, but you will forget things. And then the last one on the bottom right. This was the one I learned from the tennis coach of my children in Washington, D.C. He's from Finland, an outstanding tennis player called Vesa Ponka. He came up with a very interesting theory because there were about 40 or 50 children who were practicing tennis there and all trying to become tennis professionals in this tennis academy. And some children, like in any organization, whether it's at the IIM or in an office or in the district or in the private sector, you'll have people of different levels of motivation and people of different levels of effort in terms of commitment, right? Everyone is different. So in this academy, there were some children who would work harder, who would train harder, who would come earlier and run harder, and others who would come and treat it in a very casual way. So this coach, he believed that he would spend more of his time and more of his other coaches' time on the children who put in more effort. So the opportunity was equal, it was a level playing field. You, he treated everyone fairly, but not equally because he said, if people are put, if children are putting in more effort, I'm going to put in more of my time. So it will be fair, but not equal. I've tried to follow that in all my different assignments. Different people bring different skills and effort. And in any organization, people who are putting in more effort and uh, achieving more, I think they need to be recognized more and management needs to spend more time. So that's another pro tip from my experience. These are a couple of endorsements from uh, different organizations. So Mark Sussman is the chief executive officer of the Bill and Belinda Gates Foundation based in Seattle. He was a great big supporter of the Swat Bharat Mission. He came and met us. So he's written a little blurb about the book. And uh, that is it. Uh, you can order the book. It's on Amazon. I think the director has been kind enough to get some copies for the library as well. Uh, you will. It's, it's quite an interesting read, but I'll be very glad to get your feedback. So let me stop here and uh, hand it back. Uh, sorry about the audio. I'm going to stop sharing my screen and I'm coming back to the main platform. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, permission, sir. Uh, first of all, from entire Amranji community, uh, we would like to express utmost gratitude for being the artifact of the such a fundamental change in uh, our country uh, that we all have witnessed. I mean, we were uh, may not be knowing uh, you as at that point of time, but we have seen what all you have presented in our personal experiences. So you're all four S and four P's. Uh, I think we all had experienced that. And so it was so well uh, visualized in your model and uh, we express uh, our sincere gratitude and thank you so much. Uh, had this not been a virtual platform, we would have really loved to stand and give you standing ovation for your all efforts. Thanks a lot. Uh, uh, sir, uh, we would also uh, got a very great insight about how the transformational leadership work. Uh, with the time that we have, uh, I have got few questions and uh, in first uh, three, four minutes, probably we'll focus on the questions that are related to your presentation on large scale transformational change. And then maybe one or two questions we would also like to take up on your personal journey, uh, which in last five, 10 minutes you presented through your book uh, timeline, and that was also equally influential. And probably we would love if you spend some more time with us again to discuss your personal life story, which was equally inspiration. So we'll also take some few questions on that aspect. Uh, to start with a large scale uh, transformative change uh, in India and uh, Swachh Bharat is its best example that we can have with the complex behavioral implication uh, that it had behind it. Our first question is, sir, that how uh, such large scale policies uh, need to contextualize 
I mean, uh, while looking at the 4S and 4Ps, uh, it, it look very uh, inspira inspirational, but, but being India and such a great diversity where even habits and everything, I mean, your state leadership would be different, your habits would be different, everything is so different. So how you contextualize that? Uh, that is the first question. Sir, would you like, uh, should I share all the questions with you or we'll go one by one? I think one by one will be good. If, uh, fine, fine, sir. So this is the first focus. question. A contextualization yeah. of large scale yeah. policy. Yeah. Look, it's a great question, particularly in India, where, uh, you know, in our federal country, 36 states, unity and diversity, it's very large. That's precisely why it became very, very important to have state specific, even district specific campaigns. And we also branded it accordingly. So every district had its own little campaign because the collectors got involved and everything was contextualized. So for example, I give the example of Izzat Gara in UP. That was a very UP thing. It was also more a Western UP than an Eastern UP thing. And uh, when the prime minister heard about Izzat Gara, he really liked it. And he started talking about it in his monkey bars radio as well. Then in Jharkhand, for example, uh, how do we get women, particularly in tribal areas, more engaged? So the Rani mystery started in Jharkhand. Similarly, we had every state in the Northeast, the technology used was bamboo for toilets instead of using bricks to, for the honeycomb. Ring. So we had some broad principles. It was important to for communities to be triggered. So every Swacha Grahi, Village motivator was given a broad training, a one week training in community approaches to sanitation. And there were some standard techniques which were taught to them, but they were encouraged to then contextualize to the local context, sometimes not even at district, sometimes at village level. It had to resonate with locals. So that became really important. And, you know, programs can never, you can never have a blueprint approach. So whether it was on branding, whether it was on messaging, whether it was language. So for example, we have a program which has translated into 13 languages. This was a refresher training module called Mobile Academy. And so it became language specific. Then again, all these particular, so we would create Darwaza Band was then translated. And you would find Darwaza Band written in Bengali, written in Marathi, etc. So very, very important for large scale programs, particularly in India, to contextualize, to come up with broad frameworks and then have it applied in the local context. Uh, before I ask next question, I hope we can take five, 10 minutes extra. I hope you have that time available with you. Yeah, yeah, so, fine. Okay. Yeah. Uh, thank you, sir. Uh, so uh, the second question, uh, we have a lot many questions. I'm just integrating them. Uh, the second question comes from uh, our uh, strategy professors. And uh, the question is that at times when uh, policies are very well intended, they also have uh, many a times very stringent goals and uh, deadlines. And when it comes to the implementation, very well intended missions also, uh, when get executed at ground level, uh, it many a times rather than realizing the real intent become the fulfilling the benchmarks. Uh, so you as an architect of this large scale change, how you uh, tackle this issue that it doesn't become a, uh, you know, I mean, where, where goals just become a tick marks, but a actual reality at the ground level. Look, it's a great question and very relevant to this program. Because the fact was, there was a goal set by the Honorable Prime Minister, and we had to achieve that goal, right? So therefore, there was a real risk that it would degenerate into a target-driven exercise or even a box-ticking exercise to come up with some bogus numbers. And we did, to be frank, encounter a little bit of this, right? Because when there is political pressure, it goes all the way down the line, and then people, you know, don't take it seriously as a you know, let's just show construction. So we dealt with it in a couple of ways. First, at a political level, the prime minister made it very clear that he wanted quality. So that was the challenge, right? How do you do quantity and quality in a short period of time? But we took it as an opportunity. So that speed I spoke about. For me, that five-year window was something you might call Goldilocks perfect. So what is the story of Goldilocks, right? The phrase was, when she's eating the porridge, it's not too hot, not too cold. She liked the middle part. So I found, we found that the 
the time window of five years was short enough was uh, was to get to focus and maintain the energy and because if it had been too long you know you couldn't have sustained it but it was long enough to deliver as well now, having said that we still had a few problems right first of all how do you convince people that this program is going to you know actually change their life so we have to spend a lot of time explaining at a political bureaucratic level because the communities in one way it was easier to trigger them but in some cases we had overzealous collectors overzealous videos who were going on saying ho gaya ho gaya but we geotagged all the toilets we focused on the behavior change and we were very clear that it was changing behavior was much more important than infrastructure of toilets but having said that it was always challenging and you have to be permanently aware to focus on quality always and not only quantity and that challenge continues so it's a real challenge when you are trying to but if you don't have a goal it becomes open ended right so you have to balance the achievement of the goal within a timeline with quality and no one said that was easy so it continues to be a challenge so we we would have three more questions uh, so that you know sure. we have a clear yeah. timeline in ahead uh, the third question sir is that and it is coming from our uh, economic professor uh, that uh, would uh, majors like uh, subsidy or transfer payments at a household or individual level uh, can be made conditional upon adaptation of sanitization measures uh, sanitization measures i mean it would be done only if the sanitization has uh, taken place can that uh, solve the problem of scale Uh, that is one question, and I felt there is another relevant question. It is not exactly re regarding economic incentives, but can also technology solve the problem of scale? So these are the like two questions I am trying to cover. Yeah, no, excellent questions, and you know we grappled with these in the beginning of the program because the toilet incentive, which the economic incentive which we provided, was twelve thousand rupees, and this went to about eighty five percent of the population who were eligible. you know the category uh, according to the socio economic census which is uh, people belonging to scst households uh, below the poverty line women headed households uh, you know handicapped headed households so they were eligible for a toilet incentive now the question was it's a good question so some countries believe that we should not provide a toilet incentive and we were very clear that a these people could not afford a toilet b it would help to speed up the program right so for example if we had not provided an economic incentive and only focused on behavior change communication it would have taken a much longer time and if it had taken a much longer time it would have gone to be frank beyond a political cycle let's not forget we have to deal in the real world right this program was delivering basic services on the ground but it also it, it had a political impact as well so we could not have an open ended timeline so therefore the economic incentive was important to get the village on board they needed to understand the importance of sanitation from a health from a many points of view but the incentive sweetened the deal and made the program faster now technology absolutely we used technology in a couple of ways one was the basic toilet technology right normally when we think of technology we are thinking it all the time right but let's not forget the twin pig model pioneered in india actually in bihar uh you know made a big difference because it was simple low cost and environmentally friendly and, and totally appropriate to use a term which was used many years you know decades ago but we also use other kinds of technology so for example virtual classrooms when you are trying to build capacity and you try to do it in series is going to take you many many decades so we did virtual classrooms on delhi where we would train our swachhadris across the board from a studio in noida for classroom but field we still have to do two days of field work in the village so we also used technology by way of it backbone in our we had a very sophisticated it system with a database of 18 crore rural houses we had a swach swachhata app if you can download that app which show, gives you the name on of the person and when you go to monitor in the field you can actually ask people ki aapke ghar mein shaucharya hai ya nahi because it is also geotag 
So technology was used in a big way. We had a dashboard which kept ticking. We brought about progress. Right? So many toilets, so many districts, ODF, etc. So technology was used extensively, both virtually or electronically, but also on the ground. Sir, so I combine the technology question with the incentive question. So we have our uh, last question and we are not taking your time more than uh, promised. So last question, sir, is more uh, not about uh, large scale transformational change, uh, but it is probably very, very uh, individualistic subject to personal change. And this question is regarding uh, in your book, you call it as an insider, outsider and insider. And uh, you also say that, you know, we can walk out, uh, walk out freely if you want to. I mean, that was something uh, that was interesting. So uh, one thing that, you know, uh, I mean, that we can still understand moving from inside to outside. But what really made us curious is that how you move from outside to insider and then, uh, you know, become so deep involved in the project and leading the one of the uh, biggest change. Uh, that India has seen. So uh, that I mean, if a bit a bit light on that, I mean, you know, I mean, how we people at times found their mission of life, or I mean, that may help us to understand that. Yeah, look, uh, excellent question. And you know, personally, that's my. I think all of us have had similar experiences. For me, uh, I mean, there are two parts of the outside estate. I would say one was, of course, working in the World Bank. Now we primarily went to Washington. To focus on better tennis training, right? You know, the facilities were better, the training was better, coaching was better. But so therefore, one of so when I resigned from the bank to become the the road manager and coach to my daughter, timing is everything in this, right? And one of my chapters, if you've seen, is called Carpe Diem, seize the moment. So when my daughter was 16 years old, she wanted to play professional tennis. You can't postpone it anymore, right? Uh, so you've got to play then. So, and I was the person who had been coaching her from the beginning. So I needed to travel with her. And if I hadn't done it, then it would have been too late. So I think the timing of your decisions to take a break from any of your, any job you do, that's quite important. There are opportunities in life, which I think need to be seized. So, and many of them we let go by, which is fine, but there are some which you need to grab. The second was coming back from, as you said, from outside to inside. It. Now, for me, that was a no brainer, to be honest. Ever since I heard the Prime Minister talking about Swat Bharat uh, from his first you know, Red Fort speech, I was thinking, you know, I really need to be back in India. But I had resigned from the IAS. And I was incredibly lucky, and you've seen that in the book, how I was called back. I met the cabinet secretary in the government of India, he happened to be from UP Kagar. They played cricket together, so I knew him. And he just said, Are you interested? And the opportunity opened up because the, my predecessor had suddenly resigned from her job. So the secretary in the ministry had quit and there was a gap. They asked me, I grabbed it. So again, these opportunities to come back. And frankly, the work I did in India, the work you do on the ground in the civil service is incomparable compared to anything you do globally. That experience, the satisfaction, the ability to make a difference on the ground that would have, you know, I wouldn't have exchanged for anything else. And also, finally, even though I came in laterally, you know, I was technically a lateral entry. There's a lot of discussion about lateral entry because I had resigned from the IAS. The fact that I was from the IAS, the fact that I could activate all the networks, the fact that I could pick up the phone and call up Anjani Kumar Singh, Chief Secretary of Bihar, and say, Anjani, kya wala hai? nothing is happening in Bihar, let's move or UP or Jharkhand and, and the ability to communicate, to engage, that only comes from experience and knowledge of the system, right? the inside system. So I think I use that a lot. And uh, so therefore coming back to me was incredible. And one of the reasons why, to be honest, you know, I could have continued in government of India, but I felt that having done four and a half years, achieving certain milestones, putting place in systems, then, you know, there's a time to move on to reconnect with family. My, our children were in the US. So when I came back to the world back. So I think there's a time for everything and it's important to seize the moment. Uh, thanks a lot, sir. I think there are many more questions, but probably we will uh, invite you one more time. Hope you get some time to again spare with us to uh, know your personal journey in more depth. Uh, I would now request Angshuman, sir, Angshuman to uh, kick off. I have invited uh, I also to, uh, I am Gachi, when you work in India, he will be coming to us. I <laughs> so would love to come. The, Thank you very much.
Thank you, Mr. Ayer. Uh, thank you, Director, sir. Uh, uh, dear Mr. Ayer, Honorable Director, I am Ranchi and all the participants. I have the honor to propose a vote of thanks for the event today. And I would like to start a vote of thanks by expressing our deepest gratitude from the Atal Vihari Vajpayee Center and from IIM Ranchi to our honorable speaker today, Mr. Ayer, who, who who basically presentations are presentations are considered by people as something which are run of the mill and basically things go on. But here it was one hour of pure learning for us, learning a lot of new things, learning governance on the ground, which we don't see every day. Thank you, Mr. Ayer, for making it a wonderful uh, evening here in India, early morning there in Washington. Uh, thanks to our honorable director for inviting such a distinguished speaker for us today here at the center. Uh, I'd like to also thank our chairman BOG who had uh, agreed to come, but due to some uh, unforeseen uh, events which came up at the last moment, he was not able to attend. I'd like to thank all the faculty members and staff members of IIM Ranchi for attending the event, for supporting us throughout at the event. I'd like to thank the chairs and members of Atal Vihari Vajpayee Center, uh, Mr. Uh, uh, Professor Marathe, Professor Mishra, uh, Sakshi, and also our assistant Prachi who made it possible. I'd like to thank the IT department for their continuous work in making this happen. And last but not the least, I'd like to thank all the participants who, who have dedicated their Tuesday evening here and, and have attended this event. We look forward to have you all in future events as well. And we would like to also end, end this session by inviting Professor Ayer again uh, on behalf of Director Sir and IM Ranchi to visit us at IM Ranchi whenever you are here in India. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much. I really enjoyed it. And excellent interaction. And it was lovely to talk to all of you. And look forward to visiting IM Ranchi. Thank you. Yes, yeah. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you, sir. 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 Thank you, sir.